Now let me give you some idea of the layout of the farm. The building where you bought your tickets is the new barn immediately to your right. And we're now at the beginning of the main path to the farmland. And of course, the car park is on your left. The scarecrow you can see in the car park in the corner beside the main path is a traditional figure for keeping the birds away from crops. But our scarecrow is a permanent sculpture. It's taller than a human being, so you can see it from quite a distance. If you look ahead of you, you'll see a maze. It's opposite the new barn, beside the side path that branches off to the right, just over there. The maze is made out of hedges which are too tall for young children to see over them, but it's quite small, so you can't get lost in it. Now, can you see the bridge crossing the fish pool further up the main path? If you want to go to the cafe, go towards the bridge and turn right just before it. Walk along the side path and the cafe's on the first bend you come to. The building was originally the schoolhouse and it's well over a hundred years old. As you may know, we run skills workshops here where you can learn traditional crafts like woodwork and basket making. You can see examples of the work and talk to someone about the courses in the Black Barn. If you take the side path to the right, here, just by the new barn, you'll come to the Black Barn, just where the path first bends. Now, I mustn't forget to tell you about picnicking, as I can see some of you have brought your lunch with you. You can picnic in the field, though do clear up behind you, of course. Or if you'd prefer a covered picnic area, there's one near the farmyard, just after you cross the bridge. There's a covered picnic spot on the right. And the last thing to mention is Fiddy House itself. From here you can cross the bridge, then walk along the footpath through the field to the left of the farmyard. That goes to the house, and it'll give you a lovely view of it. It's certainly worth a few photographs, but as it's a private home, I'm afraid you can't go inside. Right, well if you're all ready, we'll set off on our tour of the farm. Now, a word about the layout of the building. The auditorium, stage and dressing rooms for the actors are all below ground level. Here on the ground floor, we have most of the rooms that the public doesn't see. The majority are internal, so they have windows in the roof to light them. Standing here in the foyer, you're probably wondering why the box office isn't here, where the public would expect to find it. Well, you might have noticed it on your way in. Although it's part of this building, it's next door, with a separate entrance from the road. For the theatre manager's office, you go across the foyer and through the double doors. Turn right, and it's the room at the end of the corridor, with the door on the left. The lighting box is where the computerised stage lighting is operated, and it's at the back of the building. When you're through the double doors, turn left, turn right at the water cooler, and right again at the end. It's the second room along that corridor. The lighting box has a window into the auditorium, which of course is below us. The artistic director's office is through the double doors, turn right, and it's the first room you come to on the right-hand side. And finally, for the moment, the room where I'll take you next, the relaxation room. So, if you'd like to come with me. Welcome to the Fiddy Working Heritage Farm. This open-air museum gives you the experience of agriculture and rural life in the English countryside at the end of the 19th century. So you'll see a typical farm of that period, and like me, all the staff are dressed in clothes of that time. I must give you some advice and safety tips before we go any further. 
As it's a working farm, please don't frighten or injure the animals. We have a lot here, and many of them are breeds that are now quite rare. And do stay at a safe distance from the tools. Some of them have sharp points, which can be pretty dangerous, so please don't touch them. We don't want any accidents, do we? The ground is very uneven, and you might slip if you're wearing sandals, so I'm glad to see you're all wearing shoes. We always advise people to do that. Now, children of all ages are very welcome here, and usually even very young children love the ducks and lambs, so do bring them along next time you come. I don't think any of you have brought dogs with you, but in case you have, I'm afraid they'll have to stay in the car park unless they're guide dogs. I'm sure you'll understand that they could cause a lot of problems on a farm. Now let me give you some idea of the layout of the farm. The building where you bought your tickets is the new barn immediately to your right. And we're now at the beginning of the main path to the farmland. And of course, the car park is on your left. The scarecrow you can see in the car park in the corner beside the main path is a traditional figure for keeping the birds away from crops. But our scarecrow is a permanent sculpture. It's taller than a human being, so you can see it from quite a distance. If you look ahead of you, you'll see a maze. It's opposite the new barn, beside the side path that branches off to the right, just over there. The maze is made out of hedges which are too tall for young children to see over them, but it's quite small, so you can't get lost in it. Now, can you see the bridge crossing the fish pool further up the main path? If you want to go to the cafe, go towards the bridge and turn right just before it. Walk along the side path and the cafes on the first bend you come to. The building was originally the schoolhouse and it's well over a hundred years old. As you may know, we run skills workshops here, where you can learn traditional crafts like woodwork and basket making. You can see examples of the work and talk to someone about the courses in the Black Barn. If you take the side path to the right, here, just by the new barn, you'll come to the Black Barn, just where the path first bends. Now, I mustn't forget to tell you about picnicking, as I can see some of you have brought your lunch with you. You can picnic in the field, though do clear up behind you, of course. Or if you'd prefer a covered picnic area, there's one near the farmyard, just after you cross the bridge. There's a covered picnic spot on the right. And the last thing to mention is Fiddy House itself. From here you can cross the bridge, then walk along the footpath through the field to the left of the farmyard. That goes to the house, and it'll give you a lovely view of it. It's certainly worth a few photographs, but as it's a private home, I'm afraid you can't go inside. Right, well, if you're all ready, we'll set off on our tour of the farm. I've been looking at ocean biodiversity, that's the diversity of species that live in the world's oceans. About 20 years ago, Biologists developed the idea of what they called biodiversity hotspots. These are the areas which have the greatest mixture of species. So one example is Madagascar. These hotspots are significant because they allow us to locate key areas for focusing efforts at conservation. Biologists can identify hotspots on land fairly easily, but until recently, very little was known about species distribution and diversity in the oceans, and no one even knew if hotspots existed there. Then a Canadian biologist called Boris Worm did some research in 2005 on data on ocean species that he got from the fishing industry. Worm located five hotspots 
for large ocean predators like sharks and looked at what they had in common. The main thing he'd expected to find was that they had very high concentrations of food, but to his surprise, that was only true for four of the hotspots. The remaining hotspot was quite badly off in that regard. But what he did find was that in all cases, the water at the surface of the ocean had relatively high temperatures, even when it was cool at greater depths. So, this seemed to be a factor in supporting a diverse range of these large predators. However, this wasn't enough on its own, because he also found that the water needed to have enough oxygen in it. So these two factors seemed necessary to support the high metabolic rate of these large fish. A couple of years later, in 2007, a researcher called Lisa Balance, who was working in California, also started looking for ocean hotspots, but not for fish. What she was interested in was marine mammals, things like seals. And she found three places in the oceans which were hotspots, and what these had in common was that these hotspots were all located at boundaries between ocean currents. And this seems to be the sort of place that has lots of the plankton that some of these species feed on. So now people who want to protect the species that are endangered need to get as much information as possible. For example, there's an international project called the Census of Marine Life. They've been surveying oceans all over the world, including the Arctic. One thing they found there, which stunned other researchers, was that there were large numbers of species which live below the ice, sometimes under a layer up to 20 metres thick. Some of these species had never been seen before. They've even found species of octopus living in these conditions. And other scientists working on the same project, but researching very different habitats on the ocean floor, have found large numbers of species congregating around volcanoes, attracted to them by the warmth and nutrients there. However, biologists still don't know how serious the threat to their survival is for each individual species. So a body called the Global Marine Species Assessment is now creating a list of endangered species on land so they consider things like the size of the population, how many members of one species there are in a particular place, and then they look at their distribution in geographical terms although this is quite difficult when you're looking at fish because they're so mobile. And then thirdly, they calculate the rate at which the decline of the species is happening. So far, only 1,500 species have been assessed, but they want to increase this figure to 20,000. For each one they assess, they use the data they collect on that species to produce a map showing its distribution. Ultimately, they will be able to use these to figure out not only where most species are located, but also where they are most threatened. So, finally, what can be done to retain the diversity of species in the world's oceans? Firstly, we need to set up more reserves in our oceans, places where marine species are protected. We have some, but not enough. In addition, to preserve species such as leatherback turtles, which live out in the high seas but have their nesting sites on the American coast, we need to create corridors for migration so they can get from one area to another safely. As well as this, action needs to be taken to lower the levels of fishing quotas to prevent overfishing of endangered species. And finally, there's the problem of bycatch. This refers to the catching of unwanted fish by fishing boats. They're returned to the sea, but they're often dead or dying. If these commercial fishing boats used equipment which was more selective so that only the fish wanted for consumption were caught, this problem could be overcome. OK, so does anyone have any questions? Hi, great to see you. I'm Jodie 
and I'll be looking after both of you for the first month you're working here at the Amersham Theatre. I'll tell you something about the theatre now, then take you to meet two of the other staff. It's an old building, and it's been modernised several times. In fact, as you can see, we're carrying out a major refurbishment at the moment. The interior has just been repainted, and we're about to start on the exterior of the building. That'll be a big job. The work's running over budget, so we've had to postpone installing an elevator. I hope you're happy running up and down stairs. When the theatre was built, people were generally slimmer and shorter than now, and the seats were very close together. We've replaced them with larger seats, with more legroom. This means fewer seats in total, but we've taken the opportunity to install seats that can easily be moved to create different acting spaces. We've also turned a few storerooms over to other purposes, like using them for meetings. We try hard to involve members of the public in the theatre. One way is by organising backstage tours, so people can be shown round the building and learn how a theatre operates. These are proving very popular. What we're finding is that people want to have lunch or a cup of coffee while they're here, so we're looking into the possibility of opening a cafe in due course. We have a bookshop which specialises in books about drama, and that attracts plenty of customers. Then there are two large rooms that will be decorated next month, and they'll be available for hire, for conferences and private functions, such as parties. We're also considering hiring out costumes to amateur drama clubs. Now I want to tell you about our workshops. We recently started a programme of workshops that anyone can join. Eventually, we intend to run courses in acting, but we're waiting until we've got the right people in place as trainers. That's proving more difficult than we'd expected. There's a big demand to learn about the technical side of putting on a production, and our lighting workshop has already started with great success. We're going to start one on sound next month. A number of people have inquired about workshops on makeup, and that's something we're considering for the future. A surprise success is the workshop on making puppets. We happen to have someone working here who does it as a hobby, and she offered to run a workshop. It was so popular, we're now running them every month. Now, a word about the layout of the building. The auditorium, stage and dressing rooms for the actors are all below ground level. Here on the ground floor, we have most of the rooms that the public doesn't see. The majority are internal, so they have windows in the roof to light them. Standing here in the foyer, you're probably wondering why the box office isn't here, where the public would expect to find it. Well, you might have noticed it on your way in. Although it's part of this building, it's next door, with a separate entrance from the road. For the theatre manager's office, you go across the foyer and through the double doors. Turn right, and it's the room at the end of the corridor, with the door on the left. The lighting box is where the computerised stage lighting is operated, and it's at the back of the building. When you're through the double doors, turn left, turn right at the water cooler, and right again at the end. It's the second room along that corridor. The lighting box has a window into the auditorium, which of course is below us. The artistic director's office is through the double doors, turn right, and it's the first room you come to on the right-hand side. And finally, for the moment, the room where I'll take you next, the relaxation room. So, if you'd like... We've been discussing the factors the architect has to consider when designing domestic buildings. I'm going to move on now to consider the design of public buildings 
And I'll illustrate this by referring to the new Taylor Concert Hall that's recently been completed here in the city. So, as with a domestic building, when designing a public building, an architect needs to consider the function of the building. For example, is it to be used primarily for entertainment, or for education, or for administration? The second thing the architect needs to think about is the context of the building. This includes its physical location, obviously, but it also includes the social meaning of the building, how it relates to the people it's built for. And finally, for important public buildings, the architect may also be looking for a central symbolic idea on which to base the design, a sort of metaphor for the building and the way in which it is used. Let's look at the new Taylor Concert Hall in relation to these ideas. The location chosen was a site in a run-down district that has been ignored in previous redevelopment plans. It was occupied by a factory that has been empty for some years. The whole area was some distance from the high-rise office blocks of the central business district and shopping centre, but it was only one kilometre from the ring road. The site itself was bordered to the north by a canal, which had once been used by boats bringing in raw materials when the area was used for manufacturing. The architect chosen for the project was Tom Harrison, he found the main design challenge was the location of the site in an area that had no neighbouring buildings of any importance. To reflect the fact that the significance of the building in this quite run-down location was as yet unknown, he decided to create a building centred around the idea of a mystery, something whose meaning still has to be discovered. So... How was this reflected in the design of the building? Well, Harrison decided to create pedestrian access to the building and to make use of the presence of water on the site. As people approach the entrance, they therefore have to cross over a bridge. He wanted to give people a feeling of suspense as they see the building first from a distance and then close up and the initial impression he wanted to create from the shape of the building as a whole was that of a box. The first side that people see, the southern wall, is just a high, flat wall uninterrupted by any windows. <laughs> this might sound off-putting, but it supports Harrison's concept of the building, that the person approaching is intrigued and wonders what will be inside. And this flat wall also has another purpose. At night time, projectors are switched on and it functions as a huge screen onto which images are projected. The auditorium itself seats 1,500 people. The floors supported by 10 massive pads. These are constructed from rubber and so are able to absorb any vibrations from outside and prevent them from affecting the auditorium. The walls are made of several layers of honey-coloured wood, all sourced from local beech trees. In order to improve the acoustic properties of the auditorium and to amplify the sound, they are not straight, they are curved. The acoustics are also adjustable according to the size of orchestra and the type of music being played. In order to achieve this, there are nine movable panels in the ceiling above the orchestra which are all individually motorised. And the walls also have curtains, which can be opened or closed to change the acoustics. The reaction of the public to the new building has generally been positive. However, the evaluation of some critics has been less enthusiastic. In spite of Harrison's efforts to use local materials, they criticise the style of the design as being international rather than local and say it doesn't reflect features of the landscape or society for which it is built. First of all, let me thank you all for coming to this public meeting to discuss the future of our town. Our first speaker is Shona Ferguson from Barford Town Council. Shona. Thank you. First, I'll briefly give you some background information. Then I'll be asking you for your comments on developments in the town. 
Well, as you don't need me to tell you, Barford has changed a great deal in the last 50 years. These are some of the main changes. 50 years ago, buses linked virtually every part of the town and the neighbouring towns and villages. Most people used them frequently, but not now, because the bus companies concentrate on just the routes that attract most passengers. So parts of the town are no longer served by buses. Even replacing old, uncomfortable buses with smart new ones has had little impact on passenger numbers. It's sometimes said that bus fares are too high, but in relation to average incomes, fares are not much higher than they were 50 years ago. Changes in the road network are affecting the town. The centre was recently closed to traffic on a trial basis, making it much safer for pedestrians. The impact of this is being measured. The new cycle paths separating bikes from cars in most main roads are being used far more than was expected, reducing traffic and improving air quality. And although the council's attempts to have a bypass constructed have failed, we haven't given up hope of persuading the government to change its mind. Shopping in the town centre has changed over the years. Many of us can remember when the town was crowded with people going shopping. Numbers have been falling for several years, despite efforts to attract shoppers, for instance by opening new car parks. Some people combine shopping with visits to the town's restaurants and cafes. Most shops are small, independent stores, which is good, but many people prefer to use supermarkets and department stores in nearby large towns, as there are so few well-known chain stores here. Turning now to medical facilities, the town is served by family doctors in several medical practices, fewer than 50 years ago, but each catering for far more patients. Our hospital closed 15 years ago, which means journeys to other towns are unavoidable. On the other hand, there are more dentists than there used to be. Employment patterns have changed along with almost everything else. The number of schools and colleges has increased, making that the main employment sector. Services such as website design and accountancy have grown in importance, and surprisingly perhaps, manufacturing hasn't seen the decline that has affected it in other parts of the country. Now I'll very quickly outline current plans for some of the town's facilities, before asking for your comments. As you'll know if you regularly use the car park at the railway station, it's usually full. The railway company applied for permission to replace it with a multi-storey car park, but that was refused. Instead, the company has bought some adjoining land, and this will be used to increase the number of parking spaces. The Grand, the old cinema in the High Street, will close at the end of the year and reopen on a different site. You've probably seen the building under construction. The plan is to have three screens with fewer seats rather than just the one large auditorium in the old cinema. I expect many of you shop in the indoor market. It's become more and more shabby looking and because of fears about safety, it was threatened with demolition. The good news is that it will close for six weeks to be made safe and redecorated and the improved building will open in July. Lots of people use the library including school and college students who go there to study. The council has managed to secure funding to keep the library open later into the evening, twice a week. We would like to enlarge the building in the not-too-distant future, but this is by no means definite. There's no limit on access to the nature reserve on the edge of town, and this will continue to be the case. What will change, though, is that the council will no longer be in charge of the area. Instead, it will become the responsibility of a national body that administers most nature reserves in the country. OK. So, what I'm going to talk about to you today is something called ethnography. This is a type of research aimed at exploring the way human cultures work. It was first developed for use in anthropology, and it's also been used in sociology and communication studies. So, what's it got to do with business, you may ask? Well, businesses are finding that ethnography can offer them deeper insight into the possible needs of customers, either present or future. 
as well as providing valuable information about their attitudes towards existing products. And ethnography can also help companies to design new products or services that customers really want. Let's look at some examples of how ethnographic research works in business. One team of researchers did a project for a company manufacturing kitchen equipment. They watched how cooks used measuring cups to measure out things like sugar and flour. They saw that the cooks had to check and recheck the contents because although the measuring cups had numbers inside them, the cooks couldn't see these easily. So a new design of cup was developed to overcome this problem, and it was a top seller. Another team of ethnographic researchers looked at how cell phones were used in Uganda, in Africa. They found that people who didn't have their own phones could pay to use the phones of local entrepreneurs. Because these customers paid in advance for their calls, they were eager to know how much time they'd spent on the call so far. So the phone company designed phones for use globally with this added feature. Ethnographic research has also been carried out in computer companies. In one company, IT systems administrators were observed for several weeks. It was found that a large amount of their work involved communicating with colleagues in order to solve problems, but that they didn't have a standard way of exchanging information from spreadsheets and so on. So the team came up with an idea for software that would help them to do this. In another piece of research, a team observed and talked to nurses working in hospitals. This led to the recognition that the nurses needed to access the computer records of their patients no matter where they were. This led to the development of a portable computer tablet that allowed the nurses to check records in locations throughout the hospital. Occasionally, research can be done even in environments where the researchers can't be present. For example, in one project done for an airline, respondents used their smartphones to record information during airline trips, in a study aiming at tracking the emotions of passengers during a flight. So, what makes studies like these different from ordinary research? Let's look at some of the general principles behind ethnographic research in business. First of all, the researcher has to be completely open-minded. He or she hasn't thought up a hypothesis to be tested, as is the case in other types of research. Instead, they wait for the participants in the research to inform them. As far as choosing the participants themselves is concerned, that's not really all that different from ordinary research. The criteria according to which the participants are chosen may be something as simple as the age bracket they fall into, or the researchers may select them according to their income, or they might try to find a set of people who all use a particular product, for example. But it's absolutely crucial to recruit the right people as participants. As well as the criteria I've mentioned, they have to be comfortable talking about themselves and being watched as they go about their activities. Actually, most researchers say that people open up pretty easily, maybe because they're often in their own home or workplace. So, what makes this type of research special is that it's not just a matter of sending a questionnaire to the participants. Instead, the research is usually based on first-hand observation of what they are doing at the time. But that doesn't mean that the researcher never talks to the participants. However, unlike in traditional research, in this case, it's the participant rather than the researchers who decides what direction the interview will follow. This means that there's less likelihood of the researcher imposing his or her own ideas on the participant. But after they've said goodbye to their participants and got back to their office, the researcher's work isn't finished. Most researchers estimate that 70 to 80 percent of their time is spent not on the collecting of data, but on its analysis, looking at photos, listening to recordings and transcribing them, and so on. The researchers may end up with hundreds of pages of notes, 
And to determine what's significant, they don't focus on the sensational things or the unusual things. Instead, they try to identify a pattern of some sort in all this data and to discern the meaning behind it. This can result in some compelling insights that can, in turn, feed back to the whole design. Good morning and welcome to the museum, one with a remarkable range of exhibits which I'm sure you'll enjoy. My name's Greg and I'll tell you about the various collections as we go around. But before we go, let me just give you a taste of what we have here. Well, for one thing, we have a fine collection of 20th and 21st century paintings, many by very well-known artists. I'm sure you'll recognize several of the paintings. This is the gallery that attracts the largest number of visitors, so it's best to go in early in the day before the crowds arrive. Then there are the 19th century paintings. The museum was opened in the middle of that century, and several of the artists each donated one work to get the museum started, as it were. So they're of special interest to us. We feel closer to them than to other works. The sculpture gallery has a number of fine exhibits, but I'm afraid it's currently closed for refurbishment. You'll need to come back next year to see it properly, but a number of the sculptures have been moved to other parts of the museum. Around the World is a temporary exhibition. You've probably seen something about it on TV or in the newspapers. It's created a great deal of interest because it presents objects from every continent and many countries and provides information about their social context, why they were made, who for, and so on. Then there's the collection of coins. This is what you might call a focused specialist collection because all the coins come from this country and were produced between 2,000 and 1,000 years ago. And many of them were discovered by ordinary people digging their gardens and donated to the museum. All our porcelain and glass was left to the museum by its founder when he died in 1878. And in the terms of his will, we're not allowed to add anything to that collection. He believed it was perfect in itself and we don't see any reason to disagree. Hey, that was something about the collections, and now here's some more practical information, in case you need it. Most of the museum facilities are downstairs in the basement, so you go down the stairs here. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, you'll find yourself in a sitting area with comfortable chairs and sofas where you can have a rest before continuing your exploration of the museum. We have a very good restaurant which serves excellent food all day in a relaxing atmosphere. To reach it, when you get to the bottom of the stairs, go straight ahead to the far side of the sitting area, then turn right into the corridor. You'll see the door of the restaurant facing you. If you just want a snack or if you'd like to eat somewhere with facilities for children, we also have a cafe. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, You'll need to go straight ahead, turn right into the corridor, and the cafe is immediately on the right. And talking about children, there are baby changing facilities downstairs. Cross the sitting area, continue straight ahead along the corridor on the left, and you and your baby will find the facilities on the left hand side. The cloak room, where you should leave coats, umbrellas, and any large bags is on the left-hand side of the sitting area. It's through the last door before you come to the corridor. There are toilets on every floor, but in the basement, they're the first rooms on the left when you get down there. Okay, now if you've got anything to leave in the cloakroom, please do that now and then we'll... We saw in the last lecture, a major cause of climate change is the rapid rise in the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last century. If we could reduce the amount of CO2, perhaps the rate of climate change could also be slowed down. One potential method involves enhancing the role of the soil that plants grow in with regard to absorbing CO2. Ratan Lau, a soil scientist from Ohio State University in the USA, claims that the world's agricultural soils could potentially absorb 13% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the equivalent of the amount released in the last 30 years, and research is going on into how this might be achieved. Lau first came to the idea that soil might be valuable in this way, not through an interest in climate change, 
but rather out of concern for the land itself and the people dependent on it. Carbon-rich soil is dark, crumbly and fertile and retains some water, but erosion can occur if soil is dry, which is a likely effect if it contains inadequate amounts of carbon. Erosion is of course bad for people trying to grow crops or breed animals on that terrain. In the 1970s and 80s, Lau was studying soils in Africa so devoid of organic matter that the ground had become extremely hard, like cement. There he met a pioneer in the study of global warming who suggested that carbon from the soil had moved into the atmosphere. This is now looking increasingly likely. Let me explain. For millions of years, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been regulated, in part, by a natural partnership between plants and microbes, tiny organisms in the soil. Plants absorb CO2 from the air and transform it into sugars and other carbon-based substances. While a proportion of these carbon products remain in the plant, some transfer from the roots to fungi and soil microbes, which store the carbon in the soil. The invention of agriculture some 10,000 years ago disrupted these ancient soil building processes and led to the loss of carbon from the soil. When humans started draining the natural topsoil and ploughing it up for planting, they exposed the buried carbon to oxygen. This created carbon dioxide and released it into the air. And in some places, grazing by domesticated animals has removed all vegetation, releasing carbon into the air. Tons of carbon have been stripped from the world's soils where it's needed and pumped into the atmosphere. So, what can be done? Researchers are now coming up with evidence that even modest changes to farming can significantly help to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Some growers have already started using an approach known as regenerative agriculture. This aims to boost the fertility of soil and keep it moist through established practices. These include keeping fields planted all year round and increasing the variety of plants being grown. Strategies like these can significantly increase the amount of carbon stored in the soil, so agricultural researchers are now building a case for their use in combating climate change. One American investigation into the potential for storing CO2 on agricultural lands is taking place in California. Soil scientist Wendy Silver of the University of California, Berkeley, is conducting a first-of-its-kind study on a large cattle farm in the state. She and her students are testing the effects on carbon storage of the compost that is created from waste, both agricultural, including manure and corn stalks, and waste produced in gardens, such as leaves, branches and lawn trimmings. In Australia, soil ecologist Christine Jones is testing another promising soil enrichment strategy. Jones and 12 farmers are working to build up soil carbon by cultivating grasses that stay green all year round. Like composting, the approach has already been proved experimentally. Jones now hopes to show that it can be applied on working farms and that the resulting carbon capture can be accurately measured. It's hoped in the future that projects such as these will demonstrate the role that farmers and other land managers can play in reducing the harmful effects of greenhouse gases. For example, in countries like the United States, where most farming operations use large applications of fertilizer, Changing such long-standing habits will require a change of system. Ratan Lal argues that farmers should receive payment, not just for the corn or beef they produce, but also for the carbon they can store in their soil. Another... Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to see you all here. Welcome to Smith House. Uh, Smith House, as you may or may not know, is one of the oldest residential colleges of the university. 
As you can see, the building you're in now, which contains this main lounge, the dining room, the recreation room, the kitchen and the offices, was part of the original old house built in the 1840s to be used by the family of George Smith. That's, of course, how the house and college got their names. The original house was converted into a residential college for the university in 1940, and since then has continued to be added on to and modernised. You'll notice when you receive your room allocation in a few minutes that your room number either begins with the letter N, S or W, like this one here. The first letter refers to the three wings of the college, which come away from this main building. Of course, the letters represent the three directions, in this case, north, south and west. Each wing has two floors, and so the next number you see is either one, or in this case, two, and this indicates which floor your room is on. The number after that is your individual room number. So it's quite simple to find any room by going to the right wing, then floor, and then room number. You'll also notice, when you receive your orientation pack shortly, that there are two keys. One is the key to your room, and only you have that key, and the other is a key to the front door, which you've just come through here from the street. This door is closed and locked at 8pm every night, and opened again at 7am. You'll need your key if you're coming back to the college between those times. We ask all students to always enter and leave the college through the front door. You'll notice at the end of each corridor that there is uh, another door, but these are fire doors and are kept locked from the outside. They should only be opened from the inside in case of emergency. In your fees, you've paid a laundry fee, which covers the cleaning of bed linen and towels. All bed linen and towels are clearly embossed with the name Smith House, so it's easily identifiable. If you want your other laundry to be done by the college, this can be arranged for a small extra fee. There are only a few rules here at Smith House, and we have these rules so that we can all live comfortably together. The most important rule is that there must be no noise after 9pm. There is also no smoking in the rooms or anywhere inside the college, but smoking is permitted on the balconies. All meals are served in the dining room. Meal times are listed in your orientation pack. Please read these carefully as meal times cannot be changed, and if you arrive late, I'm sorry to say, you'll just go hungry. If you're unsure about things, each floor has an elected floor senior, who is usually a student in their third or fourth year of study, who's been at Smith House for a while. The floor seniors will introduce themselves later today and answer any questions you have. But for now, I'm going to hand you over to Marnie, who is going to give you the orientation packs and keys. Thanks, Marnie. I hope that this first session, which I've called an introduction to British agriculture, will provide a helpful background to the farm visits you'll be doing next week. I think I should start by emphasising that agriculture still accounts for a very important part of this country's economy. We are used to hearing the UK's society and economy described as being industrial, or even post-industrial. But we mustn't let this blind us to the fact that agriculture and its supporting industries still account for around 20% of our gross national product. This figure is especially impressive, I think, when you bear in mind how very small a percentage of the UK workforce is employed in agriculture. This is not a recent development. You'd have to go back to 1750 or so to find a majority of the workforce in this country working in agriculture. By the middle of the next century, in 1850 that is, it had fallen sharply to 10%, and then to 3% by the middle of the 20th century. And now, just 2% of the workforce contribute 20% of GNP. How is this efficiency achieved? Well, my own view is that it owes a great deal to a history over the last 50 or 60 years of intelligent support by the state, mainly taking the form of helping farmers to plan ahead. Then the two other factors I should mention, both very important, are the high level of training amongst the agricultural workforce. And second... Good morning. This morning, we are continuing our look at Australia and its natural problems. Actually, dryness, or aridity, as it is generally called by geographers, is probably the most challenging of Australia's natural problems. And so it's very important in this course for you to have a good understanding of the subject. For Australia, water is a precious resource, 
and its wise management is of the greatest importance. As I've said, Australia is a dry continent, second only to Antarctica, in its lack of rainfall. Long hours of hot sunshine and searing winds give Australia an extremely high rate of evaporation, far more than in most other countries. It's estimated that approximately 87% of Australia's rainfall is lost through evaporation, compared with just over 60% in Europe and Africa, and 48% in North America. You generally think of Africa as being a very hot and dry place, but it's not in comparison with Australia. In many parts of Australia, standing water, that is, dams, puddles and so forth, dry up rapidly, and some rainfall barely penetrates the soil. The reason for this is that the moisture is absorbed by thirsty plants. Some parts of Australia are dry because rainwater seeps quickly through sandy soils and into the rock below. In parts of Australia, this water, which seeps through the sandy soil, collects underground to form underground lakes. Water from these subterranean lakes can be pumped to the surface and tapped, and so used for various purposes above the ground. In fact, extensive underground water resources are available over more than half of Australia's land area. But most of the water is too salty to be used for human consumption or for the irrigation of crops. However, most inland farmers do rely on this water for watering their animals and, where possible, to a lesser extent, for irrigation. Underground water can flow very large distances and can be kept in underground reservoirs for a very long time. Water from these underground reservoirs bubbles to the surface as springs in some parts of the country, and these rare sources of permanent water were vital to early explorers of inland Australia and to other pioneers last century who used the springs for survival. But in many places, levels have fallen drastically through continuous use over the years. This has necessitated the pumping of the water to the surface. Remarkably, underground water sources in Australia supply about 18% of total water consumption. So you can see it's quite an important source of water in this dry land. So, most of the consumption of water in Australia comes from water which is kept above ground. More than 300 dams regulate river flows around the country. The dams store water for a variety of functions. The rural irrigation of crops, without which many productive areas of the country would not be able to be farmed. The regulation of flooding, a serious problem which will be dealt with later in the course. And last but not least, the harnessing of the force of gravity for the generation of electricity. Uh, that is all we have time for this morning, but you'll be able to do further study on this important area in the library. I have a handout here with references on the subject, so if you're interested, please come up to the desk and take a copy. Next week's lecture is a case study of an outback farm and it'll be going into detail about some of the problems we've discussed here. OK, uh, welcome back to the new term. I uh, hope you've had a good break mm. and that you're looking forward to writing your dissertation. Mm. Uh, now, what I'd like to do in this session is give you the opportunity to ask questions on writing the dissertation. Uh, requirements, milestones, who to see when you need help. It's very informal. It may all be written on paper, but it's nice to get it confirmed. So, um, anything you'd like to ask? Uh, Dr. Simon, is there a fixed hand in date yet? Uh, right, I can confirm that that's the 21st of May, not the 20th, as we first stated. OK? Um, Jane? What about the word limit? Well, we try to be pretty flexible on this, but in broad terms, it's 18 to 20,000. Ah. And you can choose your topics, anything from years two and three.
Uh, yes? Uh, I still haven't got any idea where I want to do it on. Uh, who... Well, you should see your course tutor to um, uh, agree on your final title, and you should also be aware that there's a special program running on research methods for anyone who wants some extra help on that. Uh, can I just check on the deadlines for everything? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, look, uh, let me write it on the board. Uh, when the different stages have to be completed. First of all, you've got to work on your basic bibliography. And that's due into your course tutor by the 31st of January, which is just two weeks away, so you'd better get a move on on that. Do we have to have our own draft plan by then? No, your draft plan is due on the 7th of February, which is a week later, so that should give you plenty of time. A and when do we have to be doing the research? That's over a one-month period, essentially February to March. And the writer? Well, you can't really get going on your writing until you've got quite a bit of the research done. So that's really March to May, with the handing date on the 21st. Uh, any more questions? Well, sir, just some advice, really. It's about computers. Would you advise us to buy one? Uh, what can I say, um, uh, Andy? Uh, I know it's a massive expense, but I really feel it would be of great benefit. You can always look in the student union adverts for second-hand ones. Um, yes? I I've been looking at some of last year's dissertations. Oh, is, is that a good idea, sir? I, I heard. Well, that. I don't think you should read them in detail too early, or you might end up taking more of their ideas than you realise. Um, but yes, it, it really is the best guide you can have to the um, uh, expectations of the... Um, of what's expected when you write a dissertation. Sorry, Jane, I interrupted you. That's OK. It's just that they did a lot of research using questionnaires. Is that a good idea? I think questionnaires are very good at telling you how people fill in questionnaires. Uh, but to be frank, they tell you very little else. Avoid them. Mm. Um, about interviews, is it OK if we interview you? The tutors? Well, uh, I don't see why not. They don't have any special contribution to make, but you can if you want. Uh, there's a whole section on this issue in the research guide. I'm afraid it's slightly out of date. And you're probably better talking to the tutor on the research methods course. But you might find it useful to start there. OK. okay. Thanks. OK, well, great. Uh, I hope that's sorted a few things out. You can always come and see me or drop me a note if you've got any more queries. Right. Fine. OK, thanks. Good morning. This is Burnham Tourist Office. Martin speaking. Oh, hello. I saw a poster about free things to do in the area and it said people should phone you for information. I'm coming to Burnham with my husband and two children for a few days on June the 27th or possibly the 28th and I'd like some ideas for things to do on the 29th. Yes, of course. OK. Then let's start with a couple of events especially for children. The Art Gallery is holding an event called Family Welcome that day when there are activities and trails to use throughout the gallery. That sounds interesting. What time does it start? The gallery opens at 10 and the family welcome event runs from 10.30 until 2 o'clock. The gallery stays open until 5 and several times during the day they're going to show a short film that the gallery has produced. It demonstrates how ceramics are made and there'll be equipment and materials for children to have a go themselves. Last time they ran the event there was a film about painting which went down very well with the children and they're now working on one about sculpture. I like the sound of that. And what other events happen in Burnham? Well, do you all enjoy listening to music? Oh, yes. Well, there are several free concerts taking place at different times, one or two in the morning, the majority at lunchtime and a couple in the evening. And they range from pop music to Latin American. The Latin American could be fun. What time is that? It's being repeated several times in different places. They're performing in the Central Library at one o'clock. Then at 4, it's in the City Museum. And in the evening at 7.30, there's a longer concert in the theatre. Right. I'll suggest that to the rest of the family. Something else you might be interested in is the boat race along the river. Oh, yes. Do tell me about that. The race starts at Offord Marina to the north of Burnham and goes as far as Summer Pool. The best place to watch it from is Charlesworth Bridge, though that does get rather crowded. And who's taking part? Well, local boat clubs, but the standard is very high. One of them came first in the West of England Regional Championship in May this year. It was the first time a team from Burnham has won. It means that next year they'll be representing the region in the National Championship. I've heard something about Paxton Nature Reserve. 
It's a good place for spotting unusual birds, isn't it? That's right, throughout the year. There is a lake there as well as a river, and they provide a very attractive habitat. So it's a good idea to bring binoculars if you have them. And just at the moment, you can see various flowers that are pretty unusual. The soil at Paxton isn't very common. They're looking good right now. Right. My husband will be particularly interested in that. And there's going to be a talk and slideshow about mushrooms, and you'll be able to go out and pick some afterwards and study the different varieties. Uh-huh. And is it possible for children to swim in the river? Yes. Part of it has been fenced off to make it safe for children to swim in. It's very shallow, and there's a lifeguard on duty whenever it's open. The lake is too deep, so swimming isn't allowed there. OK. We must remember to bring their swimming things in case we go to Paxton. How long does it take to get there by car from Burnham? Mm, about 20 minutes, but parking is very limited, so it's usually much easier to go by bus, and it takes about the same time. Right. Well, I'll discuss the options with the rest of the family. Thanks very much for all your help. You're welcome. Goodbye.